Hello. It's lovely to be back in the same room as you after I don't know how long. Long time. It's been weeks. Has it been months? I don't even know. I'm going to go with weeks. Okay. Um, and before we do anything, a bit of housekeeping. Short on podications. Yes. Now, this is something that came up right at the end of last week's episode. And my assumption is always that uh, if, if there are people listening to this, most of them don't make it as far as the, uh, the the back bit. So we just wanted to say that if you have ever wanted an episode of this podcast dedicating to yourself or someone else, then we have cleared the backlog. Mm. Um. In fact, we've we've cleared it with such efficiency that we've rather embarrassed ourselves by uh, there the, the, the being no no log at all. But let's just hope everyone just heard the word efficiency there, and the rest was just like mumbles. <laughs> efficiency, yes. Um, so yes, uh, so if you'd like an episode of the podcast dedicating to you or somebody for whatever reason, then you can uh, email us hello at adriftpodcast.com and that's what we always do right at the back end just in case you uh, you think, oh, I've got to turn this off or if you fall asleep by <laughs> yeah, that point, yeah. as I presume that you do. Um, so that's that bit of business sorted out. Okay. And, uh, and yes, yeah, so here we are back in the same room. Lovely to see you. Do you know who I bumped into? Because the school term has started again, and uh, who I bumped into at pickup? Who? Your friend Louise. Oh, lovely, lovely Louise. It's so nice to uh, to see her. She said to give her give you her best, and we were both going on about how you don't age. And no, how, honestly, really? yeah, yeah. She was with her mum and dad, and they were asking after you. Oh, it's lovely. I love all this talking about me. Mm. It's great. And then it occurred to me. Mm. Am I going to like be bumping into her every day? Oh, of her is her her daughter just started. Well, oh. Yeah, yeah. Or, or the gates have all changed. It was di- different gates because of COVID. Oh. And I really like your friend Louise, but I, I don't think there is anybody that I want to have a conversation with every day. It sounds like your only topic of conversation is me. Which yes, I, which I like. Yes, and I would like to talk about me every day. Mm. But that and is you don't give wear... us that much to go no, on. No, no, it's going to wear very thin very quickly. So what do I do? Oh no! I don't know. I don't ask me. I don't because know. Because what, what I do. do generally at the school gates is pretend to be looking at my phone all the time, mm. and because I am this weird loner, th- there's, th- th- that's all anybody thinks of me. That they, they, they all think there's that shadow of a man who doesn't interact with people, mm. so I can get away with it. But because there's this friend of yours, Louise, who you went to university with, I yeah, think, yeah, 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 um, there's a pre-existing relationship. What do I do? And you've only got another day of being able to say hot enough for you. <laughs> and then it's a long time until you get to say cold enough for you. So what do you do in the middle bit? Yeah. Oh, Jeff, I don't know. I'm sorry. I feel bad having a friend. It's made your life inconvenient. It really has. Mm. Is there anything you could say to her? <laughs> no, absolutely not. You just have a nice chat about it. I don't know. I don't have a nice chat with anybody. <laughs> like, no chat is ever a nice oh. chat. No, that's not true. Every now and again, I'm, and it really is every now and again, because people so often will say to me, but if you went to the party, you'd enjoy yourself. I don't. Right. It's not, people seem to have this idea that oh, if you just go, you have a good time. Mm. Or if you just join in the conversation, you actually end up being surprised and quite enjoy it. Mm. That almost never happens to me. It does happen to me every now and again. Mm. And it's amazing. And then I think, oh my God, it's, I, finally, I finally got it. I finally got my rhythm. Annabelle once told me a story about when you were a kid, you didn't understand how to dance. Yeah, yeah. And I just kept trying and trying and trying. And I remember very clear the moment we just clicked and I felt like, oh, I'm moving to the beat. I get, I, I can dance. I get this now. And I remember it so distinctly. And I think that is how a lot of people feel about social interactions. Right. That's never happened to me with dancing or social interactions. Mm-hmm. Every now and again, weirdly, I might coincide with the co- rhythm of a conversation but it's twice a year maximum. Mm-hmm. And and I think, yeah, I'm doing it. I'll be like this from now onwards. <laughs> and then I never am. Oh. So what, what am I supposed to do? You just have to do pre-prepared topics. It's a lot of effort, though. I know, I know. I've already got a, <laughs> a lot of nothing that I need to be getting on with. Shall I give you Annabelle topics? Like, give you, like, five a week? I once had a... Um, a friend of mine once said of a mutual friend... She sort of blurted out that this mutual friend found me a bit exhausting <laughs> because the only thing I ever brought up was the person in common that we knew. 
No, yeah. that got back to you. Yeah, it did, yeah. That would hurt my feelings. Well, it hurt my feelings, but the truth of it is that's all I've got to say. Right. And why is that so exhausting for them? Because it is, isn't it? I mean, no disrespect <laughs> to you or anybody. Right, right. But I've only got so much I can say about you. Yeah, that's true. Or, or want to hear about you. Yes, yeah, well, thanks. Second hand. <laughs> I see, yeah, yeah. I like hearing from you. For the horse's mouth, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. I'm sorry, I've got no answers. Well, obviously, you just need to send your wife more to do the pickup. Well, she does do more than I do pickup wise, right, anyway. Right. I don't want to sound like one of those hus- husbands. I'm not. Right. Okay. But you know, for, for we play to our strengths. Right. And uh, social competence at the school gates is is one of hers. It's okay. not one of mine. Okay. But I don't know because correct me if I'm wrong. Mm. Your friend Louise Mm. seems like a normal, competent person to whom it wouldn't occur to her that just having a little chat with somebody the couple of times a week that you see them Mm. would be anything other than a normal and perfectly pleasant thing to do. This is the thing. Is she sitting with someone now saying, oh, God, what am I going to say to him? No, 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 I don't think she is. No, she's not. And this this is the trouble. Mm. This is the, you know, the nub of what we uh, we, uh, we talk about here on this podcast. There's... 80% 80% of people in the world, probably more if you look at the listening figures, but <laughs> <laughs> don't feel like this and can't understand that other people do. I just had a thought. Then yeah. Why don't you just leave it up to her, the conversation? And if it goes silent, go with it. Because then she'll think, Annabelle's friend Jeff is so weird. <laughs> like, he, never, he never asks me about myself. He's never got anything interesting to say. <laughs> Have you thought about starting to watch um, Married at First Sight UK? I'm sure that'd be a great conversational topic. No, but I'll tell you what I am thinking about. What? Homeschooling. (laughs) All right. Have we... uh... What was that noise? Then? Sorry, was that like that loud? Yeah, it was. What were you I was doing? scraping my. So I was wearing socks, but I trod, I trod in a puddle in your house. So I took one sock off, and then I was just scraping that foot along the floorboard, and it's louder than a sock, as it turns out. How lovely! What purpose is the scrape serving? Is it just a, a sensory pleasure? I think so. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it sounded like you were like crossing and uncrossing your legs, like Sharon Stone <laughs> in that film. I didn't know I was doing it. Sorry, mm. I put. I only apologise. No, no, it's fine. I'd, I'd be surprised if the listeners can hear it. Oh, and, right. Uh, which makes me think I shouldn't have mentioned it, but there we go. Uh, let's um, let's let's hear from the aforementioned uh, listeners, the drifters. First is from Laura. I was in hospital for a couple of nights, and I had a cannula in my inner elbow attached to a drip. In hospital, I'm always very keen for nursing and other staff to know I appreciate them and their hard work. I don't want to be an entitled idiot making their lives more difficult. And therefore, I spend far too much time trying not to inconvenience them and be generally more polite than is probably necessary when I'm feeling poorly. I was minding my own business, doing a bit of knitting, when the cannula attachment dislodges. So the needle is still in my arm, but the tube has fallen out and my blood starts spilling out onto me and the bed. There is a nurse on the other side of the room, but she's busy dealing with another elderly patient. So I decide it's probably best to press the help button by my bed rather than call said nurse away from my task. I don't want a queue jump after all. Besides, a little bit of blood isn't an emergency. And I'm doing a good job of keeping it on my own clothes and not the hospital hospital bedding. At first I am anyway, but as the seconds tick away, the amount of blood starts to mount. It's really coming out rather fast. I sit patiently, my own blood now pooling on the bed, hoping someone will notice soon, the buzzer next to my bed ringing. Eventually I begin to worry the blood will spill out onto the floor and make too much of a mess. That's when I realise I'm going to have to say something. Oh, horror of horrors. I spend a few more seconds trying to convince myself it's probably best to quietly bleed to death (laughs) rather than distract the nurse like some kind of stuck-up prima donna. (laughs) I do not convince myself. I summon up all my courage and squeak out a, excuse me. What I say is very quiet and the nurse does not notice. It feels even ruder to say it again, though I do try and once again am far too quiet. However, another patient has noticed my predicament and looks alarmed. She manages to say in a perfectly audible voice, Nurse, that woman is bleeding. And the nurse turns around and notices me and my rapidly expanding lakes of blood. Oh my goodness, she explains. Whatever didn't you say? And she rushes over to help. 
The nurse was incredibly kind, not at all annoyed, though perhaps a little baffled as to why I had to sit there bleeding rather than say something right away. Thank you, NHS, and sorry about the bed sheets. <laughs> um, I'm going to mention a, a classic film. Oh, yeah. National Lampoon's European Vacation. Oh, right. Do you remember that scene in that where they uh, they run over Eric Idle, who's riding a bicycle, who's playing sort of the stereotypically apologetic British person who is sort of bleeding to death whilst giving oh. directions. Oh, That's brilliant, what that just brilliant. conjured up sort of blood spurting everywhere. Oh, I'd forgotten that. That's amazing. Yeah. It's probably <laughs> probably best left in the memory, National Lampoon's European oh, Vacation, really? I imagine. I could be, could be wrong. Maybe it is a classic. Okay. But... Um, And this this one's from Kendall. The parking garage of my apartment building has a gate with an arm that raises up on each side, one for in and one for out. All the residents have a remote that controls the entrance gate in order to get to the resident-only parking. Recently, I've noticed that the one to go in will sometimes just stay up. There have been several occasions where I've entered the garage and was able to drive right in without pressing the button on my remote. As I drive out of the garage today, there are no less than four men standing around in a group in front of the gate. They appear to be maintenance workers, but I can't tell if they're there to fix the gate or if they're just chatting. I'm not sure why it would require that many people to fix a single gate. I'm also not sure why they would choose that particular spot to have a chat. Anyway, that's besides the point. When I pull up towards them, they part to both sides of the gate so I can pass. Now, this is very awkward because I have to drive right through them. I don't want to be rude and not acknowledge their presence. But how do I acknowledge all of them without looking like I'm on top of a float in the Thanksgiving Day parade? (laughs) Do I go for it and do a 180 degree wave and greet each of them with eye contact (laughs) and a thank you? Do I ignore all of them? Do I greet one of them? And if so, which one? In the end, I don't settle for any of these things, but instead choose a very awkward compromise. I stare straight ahead and wave at absolutely no one. At this point, they're probably either confused and wondering who I'm waving at or think I'm making a passive aggressive statement about them being in the way. My cheeks are flaming as I drive away, but thankfully I can now put it behind me. That is, until I come back from my unfortunately speedy errand. Yes, there's more. At this point, you should know that it's around the end of the workday, so there are cars going into the garage somewhat frequently. The group is still there, but mercifully, they've all moved to the side a short distance away. I see that the gate is already open, possibly because it's still broken, or because one of the men left it open for people to easily get through while it's being worked on. Either way, I'm relieved to see I can get in quickly. I drive past the men, careful not to make any eye contact, and start to go under the open gate. To my horror, the arm starts to go down, and I realise that it must have been open because another resident had just passed through and opened it. Now, I look like one of those people that tries to get into the subway for free by following (laughs) someone through the turnstile after they swipe their card. I slam on my brakes and thankfully the gate starts to open again. Of course, the same group of men have witnessed the whole thing. I speed into the garage and up to my floor, all the while checking my rear view mirror for someone (laughs) running after me or for blue flashing lights to pull me over and kick me out of my own garage. I'm not sure what the statute of limitations is for appearing to break into a garage that you have, in fact, every right to be in. But I think it's safe to say I'll be expecting potential repercussions like my garage remote being taken away for months to come. Uh, please send us your stories of uh, uh, excruciating social moments. It's hello at adriftpodcast.com. Annabelle. Yes. Let's have yet another way in which you are not a fully functioning adult. So after the excitement of the trains that I talked about last week, guess what I did last weekend? Got on two more trains again with my son. Really? Yes. I was straight back on that horse or, or train. <laughs> Admittedly, it was go one stop, change trains, go one stop. Much less chance of a repeat of the kettling with those young festival yes, goers. Yes. Much less chance. Although there was a chance of being kettled with football fans again, as we were going to see my boyfriend play football. Now, admittedly, he plays for Buckhurst Way FC and not West Ham. So there are actually 15 fans and not 50,000. <laughs> Buckhurst Way FC is his new team. He's got a new team. He started with them last Saturday. When was the transfer window? <laughs> He's the oldest on the team by around about 15 years. But he played well, if you overlook how he had to come off towards the end because of cramp. And then 
<laughs> he was shouting from the sidelines to his new team members, his new Buckhurst team members. Come on, Bancroft, let's make this a Bancroft win. <laughs> Got their, his, his own team's name wrong. <laughs> he also kept calling the manager Brett when his name is Brad. They must think he's got something that's of age-related memory loss or something. No one mentioned it. Anyway, I wouldn't normally go and see him play football, but my son wanted to go and see his dad play. So Tom drove there first as he had to be there early. Not sure why, like something about warming up. So me and my son got these two tube trains and they were empty. It was great. But at the change between the two, we had a very long wait. What would you consider a long wait for a normal train, not a tube train? For a normal train? Yeah, it'd be so like, oh, if, a bit of a long If wait. I was in Macclesfield yeah. and I was waiting for a train into Manchester City Centre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What would you be like, well, this is too long, it's a long wait? I don't know, like 20 minutes or something. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. And, what, and what about a tube train? So the, the tube train we live closest to is the Victoria Line in London. Mm. Typically, trains are either, it says stand back train approaching mm. or one minute. Mm. I can feel rage if it's three minutes. Yes, yeah, yeah. exactly the same, exactly the same. So if I tell you that we had to wait for 10 minutes. Oh my God. That's pretty bad, right? Yeah. That's pretty bad. So by the middle of that 10 minutes, my son was really playing up and he kept running to the barriers and then too close to the edge for my liking, by which I mean about two metres from mm. the edge. So I told him off, but he just got worse. And I was wondering what I could do next to control him when... I saw some British transport police coming through the barriers. So I did what anybody would do, anybody. And I quietly said to my son, oh, look, here are the police. They've come to tell you off. We've all done it, haven't we? Yeah. they come to arrest you. Yeah, yeah. We've all done it. I told this story to um, one of my neighbours. She went, if I don't have the police, I've got nothing. Like she uses the police that much to control her child. That's coming. I mean, yeah, I wonder if I've... Raised a slight anti-authoritarian. Well, <laughs> Gene doesn't seem that but bothered. But I've brought oh. up the police on a couple of occasions. Right, right. I think he's get, he's starting to get a sense of the law. Okay, okay. He's starting to understand a bit. Yes. He's a bit older, isn't he? Yeah. He's starting to understand it. So there are two policemen: one older, probably early sixties; one younger, probably twenties or thirties. And even though I've spoken quietly, they have heard. And the older one. He ignores me, but looks straight at my son and says, don't listen to your mummy. We hate it when they do that, as it makes you scared of the police when we're here to help. I have been parent shamed by the police. I glance at the younger one and give him a bit of a sort of an eyebrow raise, hoping to get some support from him. I get back a look that is maybe 5% supportive. Like, that's it. It's like he's sympathetic, but he actually agrees with the older one. And all I want to do now, and this is bad of me, and I apologise to any police listening, all I want to do now is go, help? Oh, right, well, how much did D.I. Matthew Cotton and D.S.E. and Buckles and Constable Ryan Pilkington, how much did they help? But I just have been listing Bent Coppers from Line of Duty, so it wouldn't have massively helped my case. Fortunately for me, my son hates strangers talking to him. It freaks him out. And I don't think his brain processed a single word. And as these police walked away, my son said loudly, why did that man talk to me? With an edge of disgust. And I got to say, I don't know. I've got no idea. <laughs> <laughs> so he still doesn't know. <laughs> I've got another year left of it, I think, maybe then, judging by your son. But did Buckhurst YFC win? Draw. Mm -hmm. Nil nil? No, 2-2. Two, two. OK, well, mm. this is something to look at. Yeah. Did Rudy manage the whole game of football? No, just the second half. We only went for the second half. Right, it's still a long time, <laughs> 45 minutes. Um, yeah. Did I, t I can't remember if I talked about the open top bus on the show last week's show, on the podcast last week. No, go on. For, for one reason or another, I feel like I haven't been able to give my son the magical summer that uh, I, I would have liked to. So to compensate for that, I've been trying to have special days in London with him as and when I can. And one thing that he's always wanted to do is go on an open top bus tour. So we, we went and we got an open top bus and we saw a couple of the sites, went through Trafalgar Square, Piccadilly Circus, uh, over the River Thames, all, all this, all, past Big Ben, all this stuff. Um, and it's hop on, hop off. So we oh. get to the Tower Bridge area. We hop off, we have some lunch. After lunch, we hop back on. Mm -hmm. It's a lively bus. We've been on maybe a minute. We started moving. All of a sudden, all hell bro breaks loose. S loads of squadrons of police go running past us on foot. There are all these police vans. The traffic goes from moving to being instantly snarled up. And, and we sit in traffic where whilst more and more police 
carry on running past us. Yeah. Uh, and we're in gridlock. So we say, oh, shit, we should get off. So we get off the bus and we start walking on foot across Tower Bridge. And this is where uh, the, whatever's happening is happening. There's a helicopter in the sky overhead. There are many, many people doing the same thing who've got off public transport. There are a lot of crowds. So it's difficult to discern what's going on. But as we reach the middle of the bridge, it becomes apparent what's going on. Uh, Extinction Rebellion, the oh, climate crisis protesters, yeah. have have uh, blockaded the bridge. They've got a caravan. They put it in the middle. Some of the protesters are on the top of it. So, you know, Jean wants to know what's going on. And a bit, bit like that story there, I'm always trying to balance... I'm always trying to not sort of inflict my views on things, even though I know it's inevitable. So I try and explain what's going on by saying, so uh, the, the, there, there are loads of people who want to get everybody thinking about the climate pr- crisis. And th- th- they, uh, they, they do these big events that get everybody talking, and that's what's happening here. They've blocked the bridge to get everybody talking about the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. Now, the police, most of them probably care about the climate crisis, but also their job is to make sure that people follow the rules. So so they're going to try and uh, move move this caravan out of the way. So that's how I explain it to him. He's got a complete glazed look... (laughs) on his face when I get onto the police part because he almost immediately then starts chanting, save the planet, save the planet. He runs towards the protest and then he's trying to like get into the middle where this caravan is because he's like, dad, I want to go up there. I want to go up there. I want to save the planet. I'm saying, Gene, you you can't. It's the, you know, the the, the, only the ones who've prearranged it can go on top of there. And he's just like chanting, save the planet at the police. (laughs) So then we eventually cross over the bridge, again, to cross over the bridge. And at the far end, the other side of the, the water, they, they blockaded the street and there's a big drumming circle. So Jean sort of runs into the middle of this drumming circle and starts giving big thumbs up to all the protesters. Oh, wow. And then um, one of them gives him an Extinction Rebellion sticker and he's really excited, but it won't stick to his jacket. So he gives it to me and sticks it on me. And then I get in this panic because I sometimes do work for the BBC. It would be a breach of impartiality Mm. for me to be wearing an Extinction Rebellion sticker. But, oh, this might be them now if you can hear (laughs) a helicopter going over. (laughs) It's really hot in my loft tonight. (laughs) So so we got the uh, skylights open. So then I become paranoid that the, uh, the protesters will think I'm some kind of climate change denier if I take the sticker off. Oh, no, this is so complicated. It's awful. Yeah, it's so, so bad. So I don't want to jeopardise my employment, Yeah. but nor do I want these people to think I'm one of those people. Ugh. So what did you do? Uh, I sort of left the scene and left Sarah to catch up with me with right. Jean a few minutes later. Right, very wise. Wow. Yeah. How exciting. Yeah. So do you see what I mean about him having the kind of anti- authority yeah yeah streaking him. yeah definitely it's not good is it mm, he'll be getting a burner phone before you know it <laughs> i've shut the windows but i can still hear that helicopter it's a very noisy one isn't it i wonder if it is after my son <laughs> Right, wow. They've come for him. Um, I don't know if that story was that story a bit boring. No, I thought it was okay, exciting. Okay. I mean, it had, it had a lot of drama in it. Yeah, it? helicopters. We, love and we don't have many stories with uh, uh, squadrons of police and helicopters and so and, and mass gridlock. Yeah, come on. Okay, I feel less bad about it now. Um, okay, but things are about to take a, a, a turn for the worse because I will give you some boring things that have happened to me. This week that I think bear mention. Great, go for it. See how many you get through before I uh, I can bore myself. Or I'll (laughs) I'll tell you what, because we're in the same room, this is great. I can watch your facial expression. And uh, when you lose interest, then we'll I start glazing over. Yeah, exactly. Um, So, number one. We got on the bus the other day, Sarah and me. Mm -hmm. Sarah and I. We got on the bus. I I got got on the bus, mate. Yeah, Um, Sarah and me. 
I think it's fine. And um, we sat down towards the back. It was a single decker. And there was a lady next to us who was behaving in an erratic way on the other side of the aisle. It's difficult to describe exactly what was so erratic about her, but it was in the family of putting her head down. Maybe there was some sobbing going on. She just had a slightly odd energy to her. In that situation, what do you do? Move. I pretend like nothing is happening. Right. Whereas Sarah mm. got it in her head that this woman was going to vomit. Oh, which she has issues with. She, well, yeah. she has this phobia, this emetophobia, yeah. Yeah. fear of um, vomiting herself and seeing other people vomit. So straight away she says, we've got to move. We stand up. The only seats free are the seats right at the front of the bus which are supposed to be kept for people who need them uh, okay right now they're empty and we both are the sort of people who st straight away if somebody got on the bus mm. who looked as if they needed those seats we both sit up yeah stand yeah. up sorry we both stand up and i would feel good about myself for doing so yeah yeah i'd get a little kick out of doing that but nobody did Okay. However, I still feel that everybody who got on the bus subsequently gave us a dirty look because we were sat in those seats. Oh, that's a tricky one. Mm. If the seats are empty and nobody yeah. needs and them. And if you're willing to stand up straight away. Yeah. But then, yeah, okay. But then, hmm. They, they're so for the elderly. Elderly. And, less able body, yeah, pregnant. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. I'm so looking forward to the day when I can just pass as elderly. <laughs> then you can just sit down, no worries at all. Do you know what I'm really looking forward to? Glaring at young people who haven't given me their seat. Glaring. Because yeah. I can sometimes feel that compulsion, mm. but they shouldn't give me their seat because I am perfectly capable of standing on a bus. <laughs> I really want their seat, and then one day I'll have the moral high ground. <laughs> Something to look forward to, isn't mm. it? I've got a slight situation regarding Sarah's vomit phobia where one of our listeners who is extremely uh, qualified mm. with this kind of thing, um, I don't want to give too much detail um, just because it was a, a, a nice thing done privately, but somebody uh, um, basically sent me something to help with Sarah's vomit phobia. Oh, okay, lovely. Which is great. Yeah. But she hasn't done anything with it yet because her phobia is so strong that the mm. idea of uh, tackling her phobia is scary mm. to her. Mm -mm. Now I feel this creates a little awkwardness whenever I mention it on the podcast because this person presumably will be thinking, but mm -hmm. I, I gave you the, the yeah. something that, that could potentially mm. transform her life out of kindness, mm. which I'm appreciative of, Sarah's appreciative of, but she's sort of crippled by the phobia. I guess it's like when you have people who have a fear of flying and there are those courses they can do. Yeah. And then they don't do them. I think if this person is understanding and empathetic enough to send something, they're probably understanding and empathetic enough to realise it's yeah, quite a big jump yeah, to yeah, actually yeah, 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 take maybe, the step maybe. to use it. See, I am thinking of this, uh, yes, I'm putting myself in that person's mind, whereas if it was me, <laughs> I'd just be feeling resentful yeah, yeah, yeah. that I'd done a kind thing. Yeah, yeah. And it hadn't been greeted with the uh, appropriate gratitude. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another thing about Sarah is we, we went to the other night, two comedian friends of hers were recording a stand-up special, being filmed for a stand-up special. So at the beginning, when they were like, please welcome to the stage, name of comedian, Sarah really whooped a lot because it was her feeling that on somebody's stand-up special, mm. you need to give as much energy as you can because you want to make it a great night. Yeah. Whereas I, I just felt embarrassed by the whooping. She very oh. rarely embarrasses me. Oh, no. Even though intellectually I know what she was doing, she wouldn't normally be a, a she wouldn't be a, a gratuitous whooper. Mm, I knew mm. why she was doing it. I couldn't help but feel like I was with the whooping American. And on a scale of embarrassment, where would it say if someone you were with someone and they shouted out "Little Mix for the Win"? 
<laughs> in, the, in the audience of okay, the X Factor. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Is that what I shouted? I think it was Little Mix for the I Win. I shouted, We Love You, Little Mix. Oh, okay. Well, I'm sure you remember better than I. Little Mix for the Win is a bit of a weird sort of sentence structure, anyway. Mm. I think I was just trying to get my voice on telly so that we could then play it on the radio and it'd be a funny moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it ended up. <laughs> um, okay. Okay, but but touche, I think, is right. Um, what else? I'll just tell you one more thing so okay. you can see the glazers. No, 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 not at all. Um, we have this babysitter we use. Use isn't a nice word in that situation, is it? But That's all right, it's it? fine. I'm sure, use, I'm sure they don't care. We use the babysitter. Uh, and she's the daughter of a friend of ours who lives locally, 14 years old. I saw her in the street today with her friends after school. Mm. And I saw this look on her face, which was, oh, God, do I have to acknowledge the, <laughs> the old person? Uh. Do I have to say hello or not? Mm. And I could see like, I, I, I could see that happening behind her eyes. And then whatever conversation these teenagers, teenagers, teenagers were having, this friend of hers used the phrase... There's a slight profanity in here. If you were the child, I'll just warn you now. Use the phrase, sucks a dog's dick. Whoa. Quite loudly. Okay. The look of horror oh, on the babysitter's face. God bless. That her mum's friend <laughs> oh. had seen her walking through the street laughing at that phrase <laughs> and the just utter panic and confusion and not knowing what to do and she just looked at her feet and it was this great moment because of course I'm not at all offended by that phrase and I think it's quite funny mm -mm. but just putting yourself in the head of the teenager yeah, yeah, that an adult has heard yeah, <laughs> you walking yeah. along saying that it was such a great moment for me have you used her since? <laughs> <laughs> it was only this afternoon oh right okay <laughs> <laughs> Okay, time for Quandary Corner at the Glap Clinic here in Problematic. And Annabelle, you were saying that um, that that this is something we could do with more of as well. Quandaries. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We're running very low yeah. on people wanting to know what the rules are for a given social situation. I don't know if that is because we've covered most things, if because of people have been socialising less because of the pandemic, because they are uh, socialising a bit more as things return to normal and they're not getting themselves wrapped in knots quite as much because it's just nice to see people. Mm, maybe. I personally don't relate to that. Or if the uh, the, the rules that we've been giving, giving recently have just been poor and people have thought, I'm not asking the, that pair of idiots. Right. Or some combination right. of all of those yeah, things, really. Yeah. Well, first one is from Madam Laureline. Our new neighbour moved in last January. What with four foot snowdrifts, minus 20 degree temperatures and of course COVID, we never really got to introduce ourselves. Not that we ever would introduce ourselves. We're not the type to pop round with a plate of cookies. But we barely saw each other for about five months. Summer came and we've nodded and waved at one another across the gardens, but hadn't really spoken until the other weekend. The other Saturday morning, I opened the blinds to see that our new neighbours were having a garage sale. Basically, several tables and bins of stuff they're trying to sell to the local neighbourhood. Personally, I'd never do such a thing. Sitting around all day trying to sell my cast-offs and batter bartering with people sounds like hell. I'd much rather put everything in a couple of bags and take them to Goodwill and let them sort it out. Yeah. By the look of it, they weren't having much success and so I felt obliged to go out and withdraw some cash and then wander over, make small talk with them and eventually buy something that's already in the Goodwill bag. Now, my dilemma is that should they have another garage sale, has my one purchase excused me from ever going again? Or am I forever obliged to buy things that I don't really need? Plus, am I OK taking them straight to Goodwill? What happens if they're at the local store and see the things they've just sold to me on display? I feel like you've got two choices for the first part. Mm. You either stay indoors and don't engage with any of these future garage sales. Okay, so you pretend that you're out or just you haven't noticed or... Yeah. Yeah, okay. Or you have to buy something from every single one. Oh, you do? So if you leave the house... You have... Really? I mean, yep. that's... 
You can't yeah. just walk by and go, how's it going? Oh, well, good luck. My neighbour's kids are sometimes doing these things outside with a bunch of old junk that I don't want. But I, f- I feel, ab- no, it's kids. It's a bit different, but mm. I just feel obliged. Mm. Do you not think so? I don't you're, you're, you're quite a tight person, though, aren't well, you? Well, I did once... You're skin flint. I did once buy... Um, some kids were doing a little sale at the park and I bought some banana grams. Do you know banana grams? It's a game. For like a, quite an extortionate price. I think it was three pounds. Mm. Second hand. Anyway, so I, I I have been known to, you know, okay. take take pity on small children. Yeah, but yeah. I think I do think I could say I think you bought one thing, that's fine. Maybe there'd be something you want. I would have a look. And then I would uh, say, Oh, how's it going? Good luck. You couldn't have a look and not buy anything, though. I really, I suppose that's bad, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, you're not there to browse. No, true, true. I think I could say, "Good luck, how's it going?" and not buy anything if I bought something once. Wow, I think that's all right. You've done your duty. You've done one thing. You don't. You don't have to do. What well, had one every weekend? Yeah, your house would be a right tip with all their stuff. So, what then about this issue of taking it to a charity shop? Then, well, I think your choices are: you could either drive a hundred miles, say, to the mm-hmm. nearest charity shop, dump it there, or I think you have to keep hold. If you're going to use your nearest charity shop, I think you have to wait a year. Think that's fair? Yeah, I think it is. Okay. I think it depends how recognisable the object is. Yeah, that's true. How commonplace it is. Yeah, yeah. If it's something very unique. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Whereas yeah. if it's a copy of the Da Vinci Code. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You'll probably be fine You're as fine. long as there's no inscription. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, that's sorted. Next one's from Andrea. Now that many of us are starting to commute to work again, here's something that has always bothered me. If someone close by is sniffing, is it okay to offer them a tissue? To be clear, this would not be an altruistic act. I'd be offering a tissue as I cannot abide the sound of someone sniffing. But maybe I would be doing them a favour. Maybe they would love a tissue and are praying for someone to offer one. Or maybe things have changed now and they don't want to take their mask off to blow their nose or have attention drawn to the fact they are possibly ill on the train. Would they then feel obliged to say, oh, it's an allergy, not COVID? Basically, the truth of it is, I want to give them a tissue to make the sniffing stop. But is it too passive aggressive? Yeah, I think it is. I think it's just a weird thing to offer a stranger a tissue. Have you seen someone do it before? I feel like if it was a little old lady doing it, it would be one thing. Oh, you're right. That's so true. Mm. Yeah, I think a little old lady could get away with it. Yes. Maybe the secret here, if Andrea isn't a little old lady, yeah. maybe the secret is to dress up as one at all times. Yeah, like the grandma from Beverly Hills. Yes, yeah. Wasn't that somebody younger dressed up as an old lady? Yes, maybe that's the key here. Because I, I hate the sound of sniffing. Mm. Now, I've got an awful nose and I'm always sort of blowing it and, 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 and whatnot. I'm sure it's not nice for other people, but I hate that sound when Sarah has a cold. It just goes through me and on a train and it's the only thing really that she does that goes through me and then sometimes i think i wonder if like if we make it to 50 or 60 years i wonder if like every single thing that you do will feel like i feel oh god when i hear you sniffing i wonder if that's like the inevitability of a long marriage Wow. but i mean it is is the only thing where i feel like that i hate it so much and she refuses to carry a hanky but she will often ask me to borrow my hanky why won't she carry a hanky? I don't know. Anyway, we're, get, we're getting in the weeds right, there. Right, right, right. <laughs> but I, I do understand when something is, is about you, mm. but you're trying to pass it off as altruism. Yes. Just, do you know what I never realised? I don't know if you've had it sometimes when people will just tell you, maybe you're, you're like going into a train station or something, people will just say, oh, your, your rucksack's open. Oh, yeah. And you think, what a kind thing that that person does. Mm. It's the same thing. Some people are driven to distraction by the, the sight of an open bag. So they're not doing Are it out they? of kindness. They're doing it because it's, you know, it's, it's some kind of... It's doing the head in. Yeah. I didn't know yeah. that. I, was, yeah. I definitely don't have that. I, the yeah. sniffing thing I have, I yeah. don't have the open bag thing. Mm. I never yeah, knew some, that. some people have that. Oh. Which then casts those people in another light, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Because yeah. I thought they were being so helpful. Yes, me too, yeah. I think I've told someone before that their bag's open, but purely... Out of niceness. Well, maybe not everybody, because you've probably had it done to you, and you think, "Oh, yeah. aren't people nice?" But right. I think a significant. I, I wonder if it's the same about people who tell you shoelaces are undone as well. Maybe they can't stand the chaos of it. Yes, I, actually, I do find it a bit difficult. Yeah, to yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Hmm. So, with tissues, are we going to say that you can only do it for a little old lady? Yes. Otherwise, yes. it's too passive aggressive. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Well, I feel like we've done an excellent job with yeah. both those quandaries, which hopefully will encourage you to send in yours. Do you have a social situation for which you need to know the rules? If so, email us hello at adriftpodcast.com. <laughs> Thank you. 
And that was our podcast. Thank you for listening. Send us your stories to that email address and uh, your quandaries and podications, which we will come on to in, uh, in a few seconds. Just a moment. Thanks to Man and the Echo for the backing music and to Emily Harrison for the incidental music. Kim Rainey designed our artwork. Carla Gowlett took our photos. And uh, this week I'll, uh, I'll finish by saying, Nurse, that woman is bleeding. All right, the podication comes from Jack McMorrow. Lovely. Love Jack. What a guy. I do think that. I interact with Jack quite often on Twitter, uh, and uh, we bump into each other occasionally in real life. And I just think, what a guy. He came and did work experience. I think he mentions this in the email, Mm. but he came and did work experience with us, uh, I don't know, 15 years ago at this point. I'm not even quite sure, but... It's just one of those people who made an impression. Yep. Most of them. If if you said to me, I will give you £10 million if you can definitively tell me whether this person did work experience or not, <laughs> I'd have no idea. No idea. I mean, the stakes are quite low, aren't they, in that situation? Because basically, either win, I've got 50% chance, or I stay as I am. Mm-mm. Maybe we should go with the gun to my head thing. Yeah, yeah. But then what would that say about you? It makes no difference, so you still wouldn't know. No. So. That would be quite a... Huh, that'd be quite a good uh, a plot for a film. Somebody who was very forgettable but very touchy about it. <laughs> who went round <laughs> executing people on the basis of whether they could remember them or not. I love that. Yeah. That's great. Um so I'm very forgettable, but I don't have that much of a chip on my shoulder mm-hmm. about it. Jack says, Salut. Salut. Uh, Salut. I just passed two years at my current cinema in Crouch End. should point out that Jack works in the cinema. Yes. He doesn't just sort of fall in love with one particular cinema for a while and then <laughs> loses its luster and then <laughs> moves on to watching films at the next. Uh, he says, at my current cinema in Crouch End, it is lovely. Want the high stakes stuff? The believe the hype stuff? The criminally good, emotional roller coaster, can't believe what you're seeing stuff? You know, the good stuff. AMC Plus has it all. Can't wait for the beginning of the end? Watch all new episodes of The Walking Dead one week early. Want to be chilled to the core? Set sail with the North Water, a thrilling Arctic drama starring Jack O'Connell and Colin Farrell. Plus, uncover gripping true crime content ad free and on demand. Expect the epic with AMC Plus. Sign up today at amcplus.com. AMC Plus. Only the good stuff. And if you take away time from the... uh, It is lovely. And if you take away time uh, from the lockdown trilogy, my 24 months there goes down to nine. Enough time to do the pregnancy thing, but not exactly uh, two years, despite me starting on the 1st of September 2019. It's a lovely cinema. I used to go there every Saturday morning. Oh, really? With Jean to the kids' club thing. Oh, and, nice. Um, and then, I don't know, we just fell out of the habit of doing it. I suppose lockdown had something mm. to do with it. Um, anyway, most everyone is strictly lovely. And even with my coordination slowly declining due to ataxia, I feel I didn't know that was the name of it, Jack. I'll, uh, I'll have to Google that. Um, I feel so welcomed in the workplace as uh, as only once before. That being the three weeks I spent at a radio station in December two thousand eight, specifically when I would get time with the home time show. That was us. That was us. So welcoming. I think we were, weren't we? Yeah. We don't remember you afterwards, but no. we remember you, Jack. Yeah. I think you know the good thing is I, you know, I. It, I don't think it's that I'm this great guy, but I'm just very needy for people to like me. Mm. But then I'm also very awkward. So I think even though I'd be trying to be liked by what was often some child, <laughs> oh, God, <laughs> um, I think that child would still come away with the impression of, uh, oh, God, that guy was a bit awkward. <laughs> made me feel a bit uncomfortable. Um, but yes, please 
a publication for everyone at my Crouch End Cinema and how absolutely positive and welcoming they are. And uh, uh, thank you for them reigniting my love for the job. It was in dire need of care before. Oh. Do you know what's great? Knowing that that place is as nice as it seems. Mm, I'm not talking about like the company because it's, it's a small, well, not even that small, but it's a chain. Yeah. Um, so I don't know about the kind of inner workings of higher up, but as, as a place, it always had a good feel, that place. And uh, that's that's what, that's what where you need to be, Jack, somewhere with a good feel, with oh. lovely people. Um, so good to hear from you in podication form. Yep. As I say, we interact quite often on Twitter. Okay. But uh, there's Jack. Two years. I'm trying to think where those two years have gone for me. Downhill, definitely. <laughs> right. Jack, uh, congratulations on your two years. If you would like a podication, I'm now talking to you, not Jack. We are short of them. Yep. Email us. It's hello at adriftpodcast.com. 